Thank you. Thank you for your prayer, Jeremy. As Jeremy said, we're looking at intersections, the seven miracles of Jesus in the Gospel of John. And today we're looking at the sixth intersection, the source of sight at Siloam. Have you ever desired something that you didn't have? Now, that's a rhetorical question. Uh, I don't expect you to answer, but I would say that most of us uh, at one time have desired something that we didn't have. Most of you would have heard of Socrates. Socrates was a philosopher in uh, uh, 400 years before Christ. And I have a story to tell him, but let's just look uh, at the verses that we're going to cover this morning in John 9, verses 1 to 7. So it says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me, while it is day, the night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed, and came back seeing. A man came to Socrates one day, so the story goes, and he asked Socrates for knowledge. He walked up to the muscular philosopher and said, O great Socrates, I come to you for knowledge. Well, Socrates was no idiot, but he knew an idiot when he saw one, a pompous idiot at that. And so he led the young man through the town and to the seaside and into the waters of the sea. And then he asked this man what he wanted. I want knowledge, O great Socrates, said the young man with a smile. Socrates put his strong hands on the man's shoulders and pushed the man under the water. They were chest deep in the water. After 30 seconds, Socrates let him up and he asked him the question, what do you want? Wisdom, said the young man, as he sputtered uh, after being in the water for so long. Well, the great Socrates crunched him immediately under the water again. 30 seconds passed, 35, 40 seconds, and Socrates left him, let him up. The man came up gasping for breath. Socrates asked him again, what do you want? The young man wheezed, knowledge, O wise and wonderful, and Socrates pushed him down under the water again. 30 seconds, 40 seconds, 45, 50 seconds under the water, and Socrates let him up. And he asked him the same question that he asked him before, 
What do you want? What do you want? The young man said to Socrates, Ear, ear, I want ear. When you want knowledge, as you have just wanted ear, then you will have knowledge, Socrates said to the young man. How great are our desires. How great a desire did the man have that was born blind in the story? We don't know. It doesn't say about his desire. But I imagine that he would have had at least some small desire of having his eyesight to be like other people to experience life more freely. But however great his desire to have eyesight, it was something that was unreachable for him. No matter how much he wanted it, there was no way he could attain the eyesight. And being blind back in Jesus' day had more challenges than today. There was no white sticks, canes. There was no braille language, no guide dogs. Uh, People uh, who had no eyesight were poorly treated back in Jesus' day. Mostly, blindness was assumed to be a ticket to misery, a curse treated by others as second-class status. Is it okay to desire something we don't have? We can look at the 10th commandment in Exodus 20, verse 17. And it says there, You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. In this verse, it says um, against coveting. But notice it says particularly about specific things of your neighbor's, like your neighbor's wife. It says uh, about... Maybe your neighbour's house. Specific things we shouldn't covet. In 1 Corinthians 12, 31, it says, But earnestly desire the best gifts. So according to this verse, it's okay to desire some things. And when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it speaks of a number of gifts given by the Holy Spirit. And it's okay to want these gifts. In fact, it is great to desire these gifts. Wisdom, knowledge of God. And it goes on to say in 1 1 Corinthians 13, that the greatest of the gifts that God offers is love. It is good to desire God's blessings upon our lives. And it's good to share these with God in our prayers. Share our desires for what we're wanting in our lives with God. Jesus had pity on the blind man and he set to give him a great blessing. So it says in John uh, 9 verse 2, and his disciples asked him saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? 
Here we see um, the disciples reflecting a common belief that was held at that time by the Jewish people. Sufferings in this life, it was thought, were a punishment for sin caused in, uh, done in the past. And each sin meets with its own punishment. For example, we have the story of Samson. And Samson had the desire of his eyes. And because of that sin, his eyes were put out. Absalom gloried in his hair. And as a result of this sin, it is thought, it was thought at the time, that he was hanged by his hair in punishment. But when we look at the man who was blind from birth, did he do a sin, commit a sin before birth? Could that be possible in this way of thinking? Well, apparently the uh, main point of view was that this wasn't agreed upon. But there was still a select few that did believe that you could sin in the womb. So you can see that the, the disciples' question was quite a valid one for the time. What about the man's parents? Had they sinned to cause blindness on their son? Well, some people believed that illnesses such as epilepsy, dumbness, deafness were brought upon the children because of the parents' wrongdoing. But let's look at a verse which dispels this way of thinking. In Ezekiel 18, verse 2 to 3, it says, What do you mean when you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying the fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel. And verse 20 of Ezekiel 18, The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. It quite clearly states in this verse, each person is responsible for their own actions. That includes sin. So why were the people thinking, set on this way of thinking? we can uh, look at a few things that are happening in this world today. Still in some insurance clauses, you have act of God. So what is an act of God? It's something that a human didn't do. For example, an earthquake is deemed to be an act of God. Uh, lots of disasters are act of God. They are termed that way. But all of this is incorrect. Satan has influenced people to believe suffering comes from God when it actually comes from Satan. But where does suffering really come from? It does come from Satan. And we can look at Job... In Job, we see the story of Job. It tells us in Job 1, verse 1, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth? 
a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. In verse 9, So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? Have you blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land? But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. When we follow that story, we see where Satan did not touch uh, Job at the time, but he touched his family. People of his family were killed. He touched his property. Property of Job's was destroyed. His animals, a lot of his animals were destroyed as well. Such havoc was wrought upon Job's possessions. But we're given the promise in God's word. Sufferings may be overcome, overruled by God in acts of mercy to those affected. And when we carry on reading the story of Job, we see that he went through a great trial and sufferings but God restored things to him. We see where God wrought an act of mercy in Job's life. And so in the case of the blind man that we're looking at today, God wrought an act of mercy to this man in his situation. Jesus knew that his time on earth would be short. And he had a sense of urgency to complete his mission on this earth. In Luke 19, verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That was his great mission. Jesus' mission involved seeking the lost. First, the Jews were um, focused upon the ones who had a wrong meaning in their minds of the gospel. Those who didn't believe in the gospel were focused on. And then we have the mission involved urging people to, to turn aside from their sin and repent. And the final part of Jesus' ministry was dying to save people from their sin. Jesus knew very well what his mission was and he went about completing it. He'd been sent to this earth specifically by the Heavenly Father for this purpose. Jesus had left his disciples too with a mission when he ascended to heaven. We can read about this in Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Also, We can take the book of Acts, verse one eight, chapter one, verse eight. But you shall receive power 
when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. As Christians, Jesus' disciples, today living 2,000 years after this mission was given, we believe it's still as important today. It's still important to make disciples of Jesus and live as his loving witnesses and to proclaim to all the people the everlasting gospel of the three angels' messages in Revelation 14 in preparation for Jesus' soon return. Revelation 14 is a call to awareness that God's judgment has come, a call to worship the God of creation, a call to not follow a false worship setup, a call to follow the Ten Commandments, not nine, not eight, but all ten. Jesus is coming soon. Are we following our mission in 2021? Do we have a sense of urgency about our mission? When we see that when Jesus was in the world, he lit it up. He encourages his disciples, us, to impart his light to others, that this world may be lit with his love. Why couldn't Jesus have just said to the man, you are healed? and the man could have had his eyesight. Jesus did everything for a reason. And when we see that he made this clay and put it on his eyes, and then got the man to wash at the pool of Siloam, it's an action that the man was required to do in faith. We have a a story along the same lines given in the Old Testament in 2 Kings chapter 5. And it was about a captain called Naaman. And Naaman had a terrible disease called leprosy. And he was told by an Israelite lady to go and seek healing from God. And so he, he went and the prophet told him to wash in the river Jordan seven times and he would be healed. Well, this seemed a bit like nonsense to Captain Naaman and he almost didn't do it. But friends of his said, what have you got to lose? Do it and you might be made well. And so he did. He bathed in the river Jordan and went under seven times. Coming out the seventh time, he was healed of this leprous disease and it says that his skin was just like a baby's. He was renewed. He was healed. In the blind blind man's case, Jesus healed him on the Sabbath and In healing him, he was breaking the Jewish law. But the blind man did what Jesus told him. And after washing, he received his sight. Through believing and doing, the blind man was healed. We see where later Jesus called upon him. And we can read in verses 35 to 39, says Jesus heard that they had cast him out. Jesus, uh, sorry, the blind man had gone to wash 
and the Pharisees uh, were against what had been done because of this breaking of the law on the Sabbath. And they'd thrown him out of the temple. And when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? The man answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see. What a blessing this man received. The man who was once blind had an amazing experience with the light of the world. It changed his life. We too may have an amazing experience with the light of the world. In following him, he can make our desires pure and give us the desires of our hearts. The light of the world has paid the price for our sin and gives us power to overcome temptation. The light of the world can light up our lives. We may be great ambassadors for him. The light of the world can give us a sense of urgency and help us accomplish the mission that he has given to us. May each one of us Open God's word daily. Communicate with God often. And we too may have a great experience similar to the man who was healed of his blindness. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for revealing your love through the story of the blind man. We realise that you are still there for us today. You're wanting to heal each one of us. You're wanting us to see what you can give to us. We ask that as we open our, word, open our Bibles, as we study your word, as we communicate with you, that you would open our eyes to see what we can't see now. Please forgive us each for our sins and please use us to accomplish your will. Thank you so much for your love for each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen.